Okay, y'all turn to Exodus chapter 6. We're going to continue discussing Christ in the Old Testament, and we begin talking a little bit about Israel last week, and we're going to talk about them again this week in their redemption. And turn to Exodus chapter 6. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of being able to call you our Father. We thank you for our Savior, for the sacrifice, not only that he made, but that you made by giving him. Lord, we thank you for all the supply, the food, the, the water, the comfort, the, the clothing, everything that you give us, Lord. We thank you for all of it. Lord, we ask tonight that you take your word and edify us and build us up, comfort us, strengthen us, build up our inner man in order that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, and that you take this word and make it living and real to us, Lord. Make us not just uh, be hearers of the word, but doers of it. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, in Exodus chapter 6, I just want to read here. We'll read down from verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of the pilgrimage, where they were strangers. I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, I will take you to me for a people, and will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, it's this word, redeem, that I was after. And the Lord said He was going to redeem Israel. I'm going to go ahead and write redemption up here. Now, the word redemption is not exactly like we use it, although we say it means to buy back, and that's true. But really, the word has to do with slavery. It's purchasing someone out of slavery, off the slave block. So if I just drew a timeline and we compared Israel here, we're going to see the picture. All right, I'm going to put the cross here in the middle. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to put Israel. Now, how did Israel get into bondage? Because that's where they were. They were in bondage in Egypt. Well, did they choose that bondage? Yeah. Now, the, the, the generation that Moses comes to deliver, did they choose to go to Israel or were they born or Egypt or were they born there? They're born there. So then they had no choice about being in bondage to Egypt. They got put there by who? I thought you meant first. Oh, first, first yeah. yeah. So in other words, they were slaves because of the choice of their forefather. Literally, Jacob took his family down there, didn't he? So then they were in bondage by birth, weren't they? Now if we come over here on the other side, we'll just put the church. Come over here. And I'll put church. And we're in bondage by birth in sin. Now, we didn't choose that, did we? Our forefather chose for us. Just like Jacob made a choice and the whole nation paid for it, Adam made a choice and all mankind's paid for it. Yeah. So when he says, I'm going to redeem you. Now, here's the thing we want to talk about tonight. Exactly what did he mean by Israel? Because, you know, there's some things that get said about this. And we talked a little bit last week about Israel's election. Let's go read it again. <clears throat> go over to... Uh, Romans chapter 9. Now this is a passage that will clear up so many things if we just let it. Lexi, is Lenore on? Lenore, if you're on there, tell Lexi. I need your address. Okay. Romans 9, 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now watch how he says this. Who are Israelites. 
Now, are is present tense, right? After the cross, he's referring to these people. He said they are Israelites to whom pertaineth, not pertained, pertaineth, present tense, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God bless forever amen now what does he mean by Israelites here and who are the ones that had all these promises look if I come back here we'll just put them I'm gonna put them in red so they stand out God made promises back here didn't he all right he made promises and literally, we find the majority of them spoken unto Abraham, don't we? And he tells Abraham, I'm going to give these things to you and your seed after you. Right? And what did Israel think that that meant? They think they're special in the flesh, right? But was God talking about Abraham's seed in the flesh? No. He was talking about Abraham's seed by faith, wasn't he? Okay? Like he learned. Like Abraham, exactly. So then the promises are given to Abraham's seed by faith. Now, back here, yes, it's Jews, but it's not all the Jews. Okay, now, when Jesus Christ went to uh, went to redeem, they went, go back to Exodus again. We have her in here. Oh, I do? Uh -huh, oh. Is she on anyone? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Alright, Exodus 4. Alright, Exodus 4, 19. The Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand, and the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto you, Let my son go. Now, what did God just call Israel? His sons, and he called them his firstborn. Well, if they're his son and his firstborn, go over to John 8. John 8. Let's see. Verse uh, 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hand, hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. So will these people that he's talking to die in their sins? Yes. Yes. Now, when we talk about Christ reconciled the world, you're gonna, there is, there's two worlds there. So these people are going to die in their sins. Now, verse 22, he says, Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Whether I go, you cannot come. He said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. So that's two worlds there. Isn't it? Now, he says, I said therefore unto you, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak, the word, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake of them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, now he's talking about on the cross, crucified, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, 
But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. That does not mean that they're saved. You're going to see in a minute what he says. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, what does shall mean? It means yet to happen, right? So he says, you shall know the truth. Then what does that mean about them right at the current time? They don't know the truth. How about you shall be free? Then at this current time, they're not free, are they? Now he, they answered him and said, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? You know, that's one of the dumbest things that the Jews ever said, isn't it? Had, we've never been in bondage. Now, where had they spent most of their existence? Bondage. In bondage. With the exception of the time that God brought them into the land down to, you know, Nebuchadnezzar they had it, but even then they were in bondage, weren't they? What did they say on Mount Sinai when Moses read the law to them? You remember what they said? All that thou hast said we will do. We'll do. They put themselves in bondage, didn't they? Okay, now, when Jesus is talking to them here, not only are they under the Roman bondage, but they're under the bondage of the Jews' religion. Now, it says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You see what he's telling them they're under bondage to? Sin. Verse 35, The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, you do that which you have seen with your father. Now, let's talk about this for a second. <clears throat> when we talk about the Lord redeeming Israel out of Egypt, typically, how do we think when we think about Him redeeming His people Israel? When you think of His people, who do you refer to? Uh, it's, it's, there's a certain group in there. But don't we have a tendency to think of that whole nation as compared to the Egyptians? Yeah. We do. We think it's the whole bunch of them, right? Now, if God's... Uh, first off, if they were all God's children because they were Abraham's seed in the flesh, then what Paul says is not true. But, if that's who God redeemed because of their fleshly standing... Then when I come over here, their fleshly standing would still make them sons of God, wouldn't it? But he just told the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. Yeah. So then, were the Pharisees the sons of God? Were they his firstborn? No. Were they anything to do with the promised seed? No. How in the world could you say just because of birth back in Egypt they were? Mm. They're not. Why did God redeem that visible nation back there? Because among this visible nation, what was there? There's a remnant, that's right. There was the election, wasn't there? There was a visible nation, and then there was God's people among them. Now, I'll show you what I mean by that. Hold John, we're going to come right back. I'm going to flip over to uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5.13 now, Jesus is talking to uh, believers here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all Jews, naturally, but He's talking to believing Jews. He tells them, uh, just to prove who they are and what they are, He tells them that uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that they should, they're they going to be uh, blessed. And He says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes on telling them all these things. And then he says in verse 13, Ye, believing Jews, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Ye are, not were, ye are the light of the world. Is he talking to them as a nation? Or is he talking to the believing Jew? Believing, believing Jew. Ye, the believing Jew, are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. 
Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then is he talking to all Jews here? No, all the Jews are not the children of God. Now go back over to Matt, or to John 8. When Jesus told them that they were the salt of the earth, literally, what, why did that entire nation that, that was there in Jerusalem, why did all those people get to see the miracles that Jesus did? Why did Jesus walk and talk among them? Who was there? His election. They desired signs of miracles to believe them. Well, they did. But think about all those Jews that got to see the wonderful things Jesus did, didn't they? But why was He there? He was there to get His elect people. Yeah. He came to get His own. Now, it, it said He came to His own and His own received Him not. As a race, that's true. But He said, all that the Father hath given me, I've got. And I won't lose any of them. So then He came... The, the election was the salt that was preserving Israel. The reason God hadn't destroyed them is because His elect people are there. Does that make sense? Same thing in the Old Testament several times. It is. It's the same thing. Now watch what He goes on to tell them in John 8. Verse 37 again. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Then are they Abraham's children? No. Now, they're Abraham's children in the flesh, aren't they? Yeah. See, Abraham's got the two lineages. And they are Abraham's children in the flesh. But is that what God was reckoning? No. no. God's always dealing with Abraham's children by faith. And that's the election. So Abraham's got two kinds of children, doesn't he? You got the fleshly and you got the spiritual. Okay, now he says next. 40, but you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now, why can't they hear? Because they're only fleshly. Oh, it's not there. They don't have what it takes. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So then he says, you can't hear me. Now he says, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So he tells them plain and simple here, you're not God's children. Now, someone would say, well, they weren't God's children anymore. No, go all the way back. Was God ever making these promises to Abraham's physical lineage? No, he was making it to Abraham's lineage by faith, wasn't he? And now there was a time when Abraham's lineage by faith, they're all along here, aren't they? We'll just keep drawing them. They're the remnant, the election. They're the salt that kept God from destroying Israel. And when Jesus Christ comes, He comes and what happens when He runs into one of these elect? He finds them and they, they believe on Him, don't they? Now Christ dies on the cross. He takes all the sin of the world. He bears it upon Himself on the cross. After the cross, go back again to Romans 9 and watch what Paul says again. In verse 4, he's talking about Israelites. He said, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now he's talking about the elect that are also of Jews in the flesh. Verse 4, he says, who are Israelites? Now, come down to verse 7. Or verse 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. 
neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now this goes all the way back to Abraham. So when God came to redeem Israel from bondage, when He come to redeem them, did God come to redeem the whole natural nation or did He come to redeem His elect? His elect. And who else got out of there because of it? The whole bunch of them come out, didn't they? But was God ever dealing with the whole bunch of them? No, you go back there and you read it and you'll see plainly He wasn't. Now watch what Paul goes on to say here. He says again in verse 4, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? Did the adoption ever pertain to all the political nation Israel? No, it pertained to the election among them. He said, and the glory, and the covenants. Now look, the covenants would include Abraham's. Of course, they got Moses. It's not any longer in effect, but it also includes David's, doesn't it? In fact, the election would include Noah's covenant. Noah was elect, but he says, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God, blessed forever, amen. Now, Paul's fixing to make a statement that will clear all this up for us. What do men say? Men look at the fact that God offered some things to Israel, don't they? And that He made promises to Israel. Now, when Jesus Christ came, did all political Israel believe on Him? No. So what does that cause men to say? Ah, oh, well, then they didn't get the promises, right? And that's why people say, well, then that got put on pause. They didn't accept what God was offering them, so God's going to offer it to them again over here, and they'll all accept it over here. But that ain't what's true. Look, if Jesus Christ came to do something over here and couldn't get it done, what does that make him? A failure. Folks, he's not a failure. He came and did exactly what he was supposed to do. Now, when he came, was he coming for all the nation Israel or was he coming for the elect among Israel? The elect. Flip over, hold Romans 9 and flip over to John 17. The night before he dies, his prayer to the Father, we're going to read. He says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now y'all think about that for a minute. What work? All the work. Well, if He came to save and deliver that political nation and establish them as a kingdom, then that's a lie, isn't it? Yeah. He hadn't finished. He didn't do that. But does He say in verse 4, John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Then He finished it, didn't He? Now He says, verse 5, And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Then did Jesus Christ manifest God's word to the ones he came to manifest it to? But did the whole nation believe? He wasn't coming for the whole nation, was He? He's coming for the elect of that nation. Now He says in the next verse, Now they have known that all things whatsoever Thou hast given Me are of Thee. For I have given unto them the words which Thou gavest Me. They have received them. Can you say that of the whole bunch? No. He said, And have known surely that I came out from Thee. You sure can't say that of the whole political nation, can you? He said, and they have believed that thou didst send me. You can't say that of the whole bunch. He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me out, or given me, and we know they're out of the world, for they are thine. So then look, I'm going to put the world up here. I'm going to put it by flesh. Who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan. The devil, right? Who did Jesus just tell the Pharisees their father was? The devil. 
Then are the Pharisees, who are Jews, are they God's sons and children? Or are they children of this world and this devil? So then was Jesus Christ ever here to save that whole nation? Did He come looking for His elect? Did He fail? Folks, He saved every single one of them. He got every one of them. And after the cross, He's still getting every one of them. The difference is, here He's doing it on the earth with the Spirit in Him. Now He's sitting at the right hand and the Spirit's doing the ministry. But He goes on with this prayer, He says. Uh, by the way, in verse 9 when He says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. How in the world could you say that Jesus Christ desires to save every single human being in the world when He doesn't pray for every single human being in the world? I want to ask you a question about that. Is that because he knew he foreknew that they would not believe in him? He knew exactly who was his and who wasn't. Yeah. As two worlds. But he could say that. He, he could say that. There are two worlds here. Now he says, verse 10, And all mine or thine, and thine or mine, or, or mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. He said, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Then did Jesus Christ save every single one that God gave him? So then he came and did what he said he was going to do. He established the kingdom, and it includes all the elect from among Israel, doesn't it? Did it ever include all the nation Israel? No. So when he went down into Egypt, when he sends Moses down into Egypt, why did he go deliver those people? Who was there amongst all them Israelites? Who was there? The elect, the elect among Israel. What's keeping God from destroying the world today? The elect. the elect. He's still got people in the world. Now what do we find out over here? Well, we find out on this side of the cross that the election never was just of the Jews. In fact, the first man God really started explaining these things, Abraham, he was a Gentile, wasn't he? But we find out that even before Abraham, you had men like Noah, men like Enoch, men like Abel, didn't you? They're not Jews, but were they elect? Now you come on this side of the cross and what do you have? You've still got the elect. Okay? Now let's go back to Romans 9 and read it more. It's all simply by faith. It's by faith. Now back to Romans 9. Alright? Paul has just said in verse 4 and 5 that the promises and the covenants and all these things belong to the Jew. Now, did the Jew as a nation have those things and lose them? Yes. No. No, they never had them as a nation. Who had them? The elect. Did the elect lose them or did they get it? They got it. They got it. That's why he said those things pertain to them. They did get them. Look, Paul is one of them, isn't he? Yes. Isn't Paul a Jew? Did he get the promises? Yes. He said they are. Now he says in verse 6, Not as though the word of God have taken none effect. Look, when you say that to Israel belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the promises, then what do people naturally say? But they didn't all get them. So then they say the promises were taken from them and given to someone else. This is called replacement theology. And while there's truth in the fact that the church is the fulfillment of all of this, there's no truth in everything was taken from the nation and given to the church. That's not true. It's always been about God's elect, his, his children Abraham by faith. Now, if you look and you say, well, if all those things pertain to Israel and Israel rejected the Messiah, then obviously the word of God didn't take effect. God failed. And that's what people say. Christ came to do plan A and he didn't get it done or they rejected him. So he switched to plan B. And then in the future, he'll go back to plan A, right? But look what verse 6 says. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect. Don't say that God's word failed. Don't say that Jesus Christ failed. Don't say God wanted to do a thing but couldn't get it done. Now is there any way that God desires to do something and can't do it? 
Folks, it's incredible that we ever thought in any shape, form, or fashion that man prevents God from doing what he wants to do. Y'all think about it this way. Paul says clearly, not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for or because they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. What's the explanation then, Paul says? He said, okay, it would appear that God made all these promises, and now I'm telling you they still belong to Israel, and you say, very well, then the word of God took no effect. It didn't take root. It didn't do what it was supposed to do, right? And Paul said, no, don't say that. The answer is this. When God made all these promises to Israel, He wasn't talking to all Israel. He was talking to the elect. He said the promises did come to pass. They did happen. The, the key to all of it is when you say Israel, which Israel are you talking about? You're talking about the elect, spiritual Israel. So He explains, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, like to explain, Here, here's the explanation. <clears throat> they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Now, when did that start? Was that something that had just recently happened? No. It's been that way since back here. Look in the very beginning back here. Cain and Abel. Was Cain God's son? Yeah. Said he's of the devil. Abel's a son of God, isn't he? Then was God dealing with the whole bunch of them based on their fleshly lineage? No. He was dealing with this lineage of faith. <clears throat> now he says here, These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that, or in order that, the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So then has this always been about God's election? Now you come after the cross. And what's the thing that they're going to have to... If I just drew the body over here like this, we'll say, okay, here's the house of God. <clears throat> okay, now, the first one in the house of God is the foundation, isn't it? Who's the foundation of the house of God? Christ. Christ. And we're drawing here, Christ. But who are the first 12 stones in this house? Twelve. The 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. Now look, I know I'm drawing these real big, but, but anyway, there's the 12 apostles, right? Now, what nationality were all of them? They were Jewish before they came into the church. But once they're in the church, what are they? Body. They're in the body. They're neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, right? So at first, God's building this house out of His election from among Israel, right? But you come after the cross a, a short period of time, they stone Stephen, and all of a sudden, God shows Peter a vision, doesn't He? Now, in that vision, God showed Peter all manner of beasts in that sheep. And what did He tell him to do? Eat. And Peter said, not so. Under the law, I can't eat. See, Peter still thinks the law is in effect, doesn't He? And God says, shows him three times. He gets off to Cornelius' house, and when he gets to Cornelius' house, it finally occurs to him. He finally realizes something. Hey, you know what? Cornelius gets saved, doesn't he? Yeah. So now who comes into the church? Gentile. Gentile. And even though he's a Gentile, see, I'm just going to draw, I don't have another color, but I'll just draw in here. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. But in the body of Christ, is he any different? No, he's no different than the Jewish believer. It's a hard thing for them to swallow. Boy, it was hard for them to swallow. I could see that, but, you know, that what the law had did to them, thinking they were special. Sure. Even Peter, like you said, still thought he was under the law. Otherwise, he said, no, nah, it's Lord. You he know, did. Kill and eat. And you got to understand how hard that was for them to get their mind around it. It's the same with us. We've been so brainwashed with the whole, with the various dispensational views and all that, we missed the big point. 
Now, I'm going to bring you to a critical point in the church. One of the most critical points in all of church history happened not long after the cross. Paul goes out and starts preaching. Now, Peter and them are preaching, and there's still Jewish people coming into the church, isn't there? Matter of fact, Paul still finds some in the synagogues, doesn't he? But at the same time, who else is getting saved? Look, every time a Gentile gets saved, or a Jew gets saved, it seems like ten Gentiles get saved, doesn't it? And then after a while, what is it? It looks like the house is all Gentiles, doesn't it? Now, it never has been all Gentiles. There's always been a sprinkling of Jews, a small remnant here and there, but it looks like it's all Gentiles, doesn't it? But way back here in the beginning, is there any division in this house? No. But Paul goes out and Paul preaches, and he's in Antioch, and the Gentiles have believed, and Peter comes up there and visits him. Y'all remember that? And some come from James, from the church in Jerusalem, and they come there. And when they came, Peter separated, didn't he? And when he separated, it caused such a confusion that even Barnabas got caught up in it. You know, that's natural. It's easy to think that way, isn't it? Yeah. So then what did Peter do? He split the church right down the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul stood up and rebuked him in front of everybody, didn't he? Thank God Paul did that. But I'm even more thankful for Peter's reaction. You talk about a crucial moment in church. That the church history, right there at the beginning... When it's already gotten fissures and all this, you've got the two main men in the church that are doing the, pre the most preaching. And those two, if they would have split, what would it have done to the church back there early on? Man, it would have been... It would, I mean, it would, so what? It wouldn't be it would, it would have, I mean, it would be horrible, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine if Peter, who everybody looked up to, imagine if Peter would have... Uh, supported the idea that the Gentiles have got to get circumcised and keep the law. There, I mean, there'd have been no recovery in it. They'd have had Peter, right? But think what happens. Paul stands up and he rebukes Peter in front of all of them, doesn't he? Yeah. He gets all over him and tells him, you know, you've been acting like a Gentile, now you're going to do this and all. Y'all think about Peter for a moment. Now, Peter's a big man in the church. He's respected. Here's Paul, who, who's the Jewish believers didn't really think a lot of. But here's Paul. He's just gotten on Peter in front of the whole group. If you were Peter, and Paul had just called you on the carpet in front of everybody, what would be your natural reaction? Man. Get mad and defend yourself. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Hey, y'all know human nature. You're going to want to defend yourself and save face, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Thank God that's Peter's crowning moment to me in all the Scriptures. You know what Peter said? He accepted Paul's rebuke. Now, how do I know that? Because look what he wrote in 2 Peter. He said, Even as our beloved brother Paul hath written unto you with the wisdom God's given him. He had to see it. And God was involved in that because, look, he couldn't have that split between them two that early on. You know what I thought about that, Troy? The persecution they was under. The law, James, he believed in Jesus. I don't know if he believed he's a son of God, but he believed something about that, but yet he still was imposing that law. Yeah. He sent spies out to, you know, to, to check on Paul and Peter. But I, I was wondering about that if uh, he was kind of an elder somehow or another amongst the, you know, the ones that believed, but yet he had spies going to see him about Paul and, uh, and Well, he, he said they, they went out from us, you know, he said, but we, they didn't, we didn't send these men out, but they came out of there, didn't yeah, they? From James. From, from the church in Jerusalem. Yeah. Kind of makes you think he's a leader, you know. Well, he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. No doubt about that. Jesus is a half-brother, right? Yeah. But was he saved? That's what I was wondering. I mean, if he believed in the Lord was, you know, the Son of God. Yeah. You know, I, I know I know there's a lot of things about that and we've talked about it now, but one of the things to realize is the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him in resurrection. Yeah. I don't think he'd have done that if he wasn't saved. But did the church in Jerusalem follow their natural tendency and go back to the law? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And and that's how men came out of there and went out and started doing this, didn't yeah, it? Was we? Paul that kind of helped those ones that was, you know, having trouble with that. It was. Follow them along. Now, it was, for sure. Okay, so then we've got one house over here, right? 
Is this house got anything to do with Jew or Gentile, or is it all God's elect? Okay, it's all God's elect. What will this house ultimately include? Just people after the cross? It's going to include all these too. All of them. So then, when Jesus Christ, when God, I'll say Jehovah God, sends Moses to deliver or redeem Israel out from under their bondage, right? Was it just delivering them out from the Egyptian bondage that was the goal? That's what it looks like to the nation, doesn't it? But getting that nation out of there, it wasn't actually the Egyptian bondage of the servitude that was a thing. The physical nation was under that. But what was God's elect suffering in in that country? Who, who did Egypt worship? I will worship. And God went and got His Son, His firstborn, and got Him out of there, didn't He? Now when you get Him out in the wilderness, during 40 years in the wilderness, you find out something. They ain't all God's children, are they? Brain <laughs> right. A mixed multitude came out and they fell right away, didn't they? But what you find out is that God's always had this elect, this, this election. Now go over to Romans 11. Romans 11, 1. He says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. See, that's what you would think if you thought God had made these promises to the political nation. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't accept him, so God cast them away. No, God did not cast away his people. He says, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. In other words, God has not cast away His people because He foreknew them. They're the election. Yeah. He foreknew them before the foundation of the world, didn't He? Well, now, we're talking about earlier, he, he foreknew it. He, he knew it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now He says, What saith the scripture of Elias? How He maketh intercession against God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed Thy prophets, dig down Thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto Him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So, Elijah looked out at the, the visible, physical, political nation, and what did he say? I'm the last one left. I'm the only one that's not an idol worshiper. And God said, no, there's 7,000. You can't see them, but they're there. Paul says in the next verse 5, even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Question, well, what's going on then? Israel, political, the nation, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. They sought for righteousness under the law by their works, and they never got it, did they? He said, but the election among Israel, the true Israelite, the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So then when God redeemed Israel, was God's motive to redeem the whole bunch, or was God there to get His Son? His Son. The others came out, but it was His Son He was after. Hey, now, if we take that and go over, I'll give you an example. Go to uh, John 1. John 1, uh, 45. Well, let's read 43. The day following, Jesus go forth into Galilee, and he findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? He didn't understand him. He knew the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. See, they didn't understand the difference between being born there and coming out of there where he lived. So he said, Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed. Huh? What's that mean? 
He's a believer. He's a believer. He's the elect, a real Israelite. Now watch what happens. In whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when I was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Did, was Nathanael one of his elect? Did he know his voice? Did he believe? He said, All that the Father give me come unto me. Did Nathanael come unto him? Did he lose Nathanael? When presented with his Messiah, did, Nath did Nathaniel believe? He's one of God's elect. Faith. This is, the, this is the whole thing that God's doing here. And when you come over here, you find the same thing. Foreknew. And God foreknew. Okay, now let me give you another example. Go back over to Luke 2. There's a great example back here. That was a division between the Pharisees and the Pharisees. You know, coming... He was coming born in Jerusalem but they say you know he'd come out of the, the other place it was division yeah. they did they couldn't they couldn't understand yes. it you know the scripture also said he would come out of Egypt yeah and he did as a young child didn't he so they search the scriptures and you know if one come from 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 Ju uh, Jerusalem yeah. and not yeah yeah they thought they understood the scriptures and they didn't did. no, all right now it says uh uh, Mary and them are bringing uh, Jesus. She's, they will just read from verse uh, 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout. Now, what's the only way anybody's ever been justified in Scripture? Imputed, Imputed by, by, he's by faith. Mm -hmm. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's the Messiah. Yeah. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he's about, he, you're talking about he's a month old, basically. They're coming to do the purification. It says, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Now watch. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Did he know who the Messiah was coming to say? Gentiles and Israel. Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Notice he just says many, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Not all. For a sign which shall be spoken, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Even Mary's going to have to be put under the conviction of her sin, isn't she? Yeah. Now watch this woman I was after, verse 36. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. That's Asher. She was of great age, and she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. She coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake to him of all uh, spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now, what in the world is this woman looking for? Mm -hmm. She's looking for the Messiah, redemption. All right, I'm going to put her right here, Anna. Now, first off, she's of the tribe of Asher. Well, you know, you go back here, in Solomon's day back here, they split. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom, huh? Two and, and ten. Two and ten. And people tend to believe that, well, from that point forward, matter of fact, they even talk about the lost ten tribes, that they're gone, right? Well, here's one a thousand years later that knows she's from the tribe of Asher. She's there. Yeah. See, God always had His election. Now let me show you what I mean. Go back to uh, 1 Kings 17. No, wrong, wrong one. 1 Kings 12. I'm sorry, 1 Kings 12. Now, y'all remember what happened. Solomon dies. He had the kingdom was united. Solomon dies. And he, his son, 
comes up to rule in his stead. And he's, the old timers come and say you need to relax these taxes. The temple's done. You need to take it easy on the people. And the old timers give him good advice. But he listens to his young buddies instead. And you remember what his young buddies told him? You tell him they just think your father was tough. Boy, you're going to really lay hunt. Yeah. So then they do it. And now there's a man, Jeroboam, that comes along. And he God splits the kingdom and Jeroboam goes up north. Now Jeroboam immediately goes up north and builds two false temples with two golden calves and gets all the people to go into the way of idolatry, doesn't he? But watch what it says, uh, verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them about the taxes, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your, own, to your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. Right? So they're going to leave. They're going to go up north. It says, But as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then were their children from the other tribes reigned, living among Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And when you go down later, you find out that there was people that did not want to, to get involved in that idolatry. They were God's elect from the other tribes. And so where did they go? They went down to Jerusalem. And they're there, they're there all the way. There's always a remnant of all the tribes reckoned in there among Judah. Hey, go to uh, 2 Chronicles 11. If it was just Judah and Benjamin, then you could talk about the lost tribes, but you can't. There's always this election. All right, in 2 Chronicles 11, we've got the same thing. Rehoboam comes to Jerusalem, and y'all know what he does. He gathers them together, and you know the whole story. But come on down to verse uh, 13. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. Remember, the Levites lived among all the tribes, didn't they? It says, verse 14, For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. So then did all the Levites come to Judah? So then what do you wind up with in Judah? You wind up with God's election in Judah. Now, was all Judah God's elect? No. No. But was God's election among them? They are. So then this is how it, the Lord's working. Now when it talks about the Lord redeeming them. Did the Lord redeem them out from under bondage? He did. But the bondage of Egypt was just a picture. It's just a picture of the true redemption. Who has the Lord redeemed over here? His elect. Out from under the bondage of what? Sin. Now, how do you know that it doesn't apply to the, the, not those that are of the world? Because we just read the verse that Jesus told them they're going to die in their sins, aren't they? Well, how could they die in their sins if He redeemed them from their sins? Go to Acts chapter 20. In Acts 20, Paul saying bye to the elders from uh, Ephesus. And in verse 27, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Then who did Christ actually purchase? Church. The church, the flock, his people, right? Go over to Ephesians 5. The remnant. The remnant, there you go. The election. Ephesians 5. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Then who did Christ come to redeem? 
church. The church is election. Now you had the church in the wilderness back here. And folks, the church in the wilderness is not referring to the whole shooting match. It's the election that we're among them. Go over to 1 Peter 1. First Peter 1 verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. What was the vain conversation that they needed to be redeemed from? That their fathers had got them into? Moses' law, the Judaism. Yeah, so he said you've been redeemed from this. The, the law pointed out their sin. He said, but... You've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. For who? For you who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Then did He come for all those others or did He come for His church? church. He came for His church. That's the whole purpose of what He's come for. Um, there's one more I want to go to and now it just left my mind. No, I got, no Ephesians 1. That's where I want to go. Back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Did God select, no, foreordain back here all those He was going to yes. redeem? He yes. did. And what did Christ say over here? Of all those you've given me, I've lost nothing. So did Christ come? Did He say, I've done the work you gave me? On the cross, did He die to redeem them? And He said, none will be lost, didn't He? So then here you've got the church over here that He's building. And at first, the election seemed to come primarily out from among the Jews, don't they? Then it seems like it's primarily Gentiles. But according to Paul, right at the end, it looks like it's going to be an influx of Jews again, doesn't it? But is there any difference between Jew and Gentile in this body? Now back here, when he was dealing with Israel, was it just Jews back here that were the elect? There were some Gentiles in there too. For instance, here's Rahab right here, isn't there? Rahab's reckoned in there. How about Ruth? Here's Ruth, isn't it? Now, are they, you say yes, but they had to become Jews. They didn't become Jews, they're women. Woman can't become a Jew. <laughs> See, he was always dealing with his elect. He was never looking at the flesh. He was always looking at a lineage of faith. And that lineage stretches throughout all nations. That's why over here, when you see the people around God's throne, it says there's a multitude no man can count of every tongue, every kindred, every nation, and every tribe. Okay? And who are they all? They're all Abraham's seed by faith. And that's why Paul says, one, one more verse, flip over to Galatians. Galatians 4.1 He says, now I say that the heir, this is one of the elect amongst Israel, okay? That the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Even though they were his elect, Israel, the elect were under the law, weren't they? For instance, Paul, he said, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, the election amongst Israel, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Before He can receive even the elect Jew as the adoption of sons, what did He have to do? 
do away with the law. Yes. And, and doing away with the law not only made it possible for them to get out from under the vain conversation received by tradition from their fathers where they could be adopted, but getting rid of the law also made it possible for Gentiles to come in, didn't it? Yes. Troy, that remnant, it, it walked by faith. And, and, and they believed in God. Mm -hmm. Oh, they was able to keep the law because of that and the blood sacrifice. In other well, words, they were blessed because they walked by faith. You know, they did, but they didn't keep the law. Well, uh, even that remnant? No, they might have tried, but they didn't. For instance, was David of the remnant? Yes. Did David keep the law? No, he broke it. He broke it. But they did have the sacrifice that yes. pictured, but that sacrifice didn't do anything but picture what yes. that remnant believed. Yes. Yeah. But, I, you know, there's so much about that that people think, you know, that it's, it's some of them been able to keep it. But that's what I've wondered. If you, you follow God's pattern the way He sat down before them just because of the grace that's given to them that believe. And, and, and in other words, they could do a better job of it. Well, they, they were sincere and wanting to. Yes. But the same thing can be said of us over here. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah, Paul said yeah. he delighted in the law of God. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I can tell you honestly, I look at those Ten Commandments and I delight to want to live that way. Yeah. I, I don't need to even get to the Ten, the first two. I want to love God with all my heart and I want to love my neighbors myself. Now, I fail at it, but I just seriously desire yeah. to do it. Yeah. And, and that's the same with them, what you're saying. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can see that. But... All right, any questions about that? All right. Okay. Thank you all very much.